Well, what is up, Mission? Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mike Hickerson. I'm honored to be the lead pastor of Mission Church, man. Uh, if you're online or hanging out on the patio, come on inside. It's getting ready to get rainy, so come on inside. Or if you're in the lobby, welcome, welcome, welcome. I know you've got lots of options on the weekend, man. Honored that Mission's one of your options. Again, around here, we believe that God is who he says he is and will do everything that he promised to do. We believe that he sent Jesus into the mess to rescue and save, uh, not because we're perfect, but because he is perfect and wants to restore us as much loved sons and daughters. And that's what the right and privilege that we have together. We believe that there's hope for every single one of us around here, uh, no matter where you've been or what you've been through or how you're hustling or what you're trying to hide, that man, God is calling you to him no matter what. And that change is possible. That we don't have to stay stuck in the same hurts or habits or hangups that have kind of gotten us where we are. Um, that literally God has given us everything we need to li live the life that he's called us to. Right? Like he's given us himself as his presence. He's given us his son in Jesus. He's given us his Holy Spirit that in, it like transforms us from the inside out. He's given us his word. And he's given us this imperfect body of people called the church together to be on mission together. Right? And anyone is welcome into this, no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've been through, man, you are welcome to, to the invitation that God has for us. But it's important to start that no one is perfect. Like not one person in this room on this stage is perfect. Um, so in fact, you're like, it, that may be like, yes, I wanted to tell the people next to me that they're not perfect for so long because they think they're so amazing. So this is your chance at mission right now. I just want you to be like, just take a deep breath and go like, man, I've been wanting to tell you this for so long. Um, and I want you to turn to the person next to you and be like, hey, he's telling me to do it. I would never say this to you, but he's telling me to. So turn to the person next to you and be like, hey, I want you to know that you are not perfect. So go ahead. Go turn to the person next to you. Let them know that. Get it off your chest. You've been wanting to tell them for so long. They're going to tell you. Yeah, you're not either, sucker. So back up, you know. All right. Wow. Don't enjoy that too much. That's, that's weird if you enjoy that too much, all right? Like, I see you post on social media. Don't enjoy that too much, telling each other how imperfect. I'm joking, I'm joking. We don't do that in a shame way to power up on the people next to us at all. You're going to be tempted to do that later when you fight or when you're in conflict to like power up of how imperfect they are. We don't do that as the church together. We do that as a way to go like, man, without Jesus, I'm sunk and you're sunk. And so, but because God is perfect and sent his perfect son into the mess to rescue and save, we have the right to be restored as much love sons and daughters. And that is why we have hope. That's what our hope is tethered to. That's what we cling to. That's what we go after together. And we've been in this series called like, you know, some things never change because there's a whole lot of stuff that changes in our world. Um, fashion, style, shows, you know, you know, philosophy, everything changes. But you know what doesn't change? That God is who he says he is and will do everything that he promised to do. We started this series, like week one was an awesome, awesome, awesome message. You know what? That God still reigns on his throne. No matter how it may feel in the moment of your situation, that God is still on his throne. If it's up and to the right, great, God still reigns. If it's down and to the left, that's, that's fine. God still reigns. When evil comes, God still reigns. When pain comes, God still reigns. When it gets complicated, God still reigns. In the election cycle coming up in November, will that be complicated? Probably not. Um, but God still reigns. God still reigns, right? No matter what's going on in our world, man, God is who he says he is and will do everything that he promised to do, even if it looks confusing to us. And even maybe in our situation, it feels like he's absent or disconnected. God still reigns and has not bailed on you. And we talked last week that the Bible still speaks. Man, God's word is powerful. It's, we can stand on it. We can stand under it. We need to get it inside of us. We're not just trying to get through it. We're trying to get it through us. And then we apply it. Like we put it into action. I'm not real, real worried about if you could kill in a game of Bible Jeopardy. I really do care about it, that we are under obedience to God's word. Not that we know it, that we live it and apply it. Where we live, work, and play. Today, I mean, it's hard to mess up this message. It's Jesus still saves. So like we're going to have some fun today. We're going to watch baptisms. We're going to watch it enacted in front of us. And next week, one of my friends, one of my favorite people, maybe one of the pastors that I respect the most for his class, for his excellence, for his character, is a guy named Gene Apple. He's coming up and he's going to be teaching that the spirit still empowers. He's been a mentor for me. I love him. So do not miss next week. I guarantee you. So God still reigns, the Bible still speaks, uh, Jesus still saves, and the Spirit still empowers. Did you know that the Bible may be the most authenticated, validated, and trustworthy document you will ever hold in your hand? 
It's the most historically validated document you will, you will ever hold in your hand by far. And we can trust it. And it points us to Jesus. Um, I, w- I heard this story. It was crazy to me. Um, I was just like kind of doing some research and hanging out and like watching a couple things and listening to a couple pastors. And I heard this story and it like blew me away. And I did some research on it. And it's, tr- it's true. I know, shocker, that sometimes pastors... Uh, don't always tell the 100% truth. They like to make their stories better. But I found this story and it, it was true and it blew me away. I don't know if you've ever heard about the Salvatore Mundi. Anyone? I'm sure there's like a ton of art people in here that understand the Salvatore Mundi. Like, like you know, like finding, like lost, lo, like a lost Leonardo documentary. A ton of art people in here. No art people. Okay, I wasn't either. And I, I, I didn't believe it. And then I started doing some research. So this is the Salvatore Monday. Look, we'll, just, we'll just leave up this up here for a while, right? And you, I'm sure you're fascinated now and you're going to do some Google research later to fact check me. But in 2005, at an art auction in New Orleans, this thing showed up for sale. And it was like... Uh, Something was like around the time of Leonardo da Vinci, this was painted, and it's like it's it's a it's a fascinating piece of art. Uh, I mean, it's obviously about Jesus, but it's a fascinating piece of art. So it shows up in this auction house in New Orleans in 2005, and people are like, "Well, that's cool." And so people start doing a little bit of research about it, and then people are like, "Some Christ fault." They were like fascinated by the subject of it because it's a really great piece of art. So they bought it in 2005 for $1,275. And you probably have never bought a piece of art for, maybe you have, like maybe you're an art person, big, big art guy. I didn't know that. So, but this was bought for $1,275 in 2005 in New Orleans. And then they started doing some facts on it, like trying to figure out like, when was this painted? Cause it's around the time of Da Vinci. Like they're trying to figure out when it's painted. So they take it to New York they take it to the Louvre in Paris. Like they start realizing that there's something to this thing. They're scraping off very delicately all the like stuff that was done to restore it. And they're getting back down to what it actually was. I don't want to ruin the whole documentary for you or the story of it. But it actually is one of the 15 pieces of art that Da Vinci painted that we have on the planet. Like, right? The Last Supper that's, you know, on the, the, the Mona Lisa and then this Salvatore Monday. It sells. And I know that you're a big art person, so you probably know this already. Um, it sells in 2017 in London to a Saudi prince who definitely believed that it was a da Vinci for $450 million. The most expensive piece of art that's ever been sold. Not, not, and it hasn't been seen since. So if you can find it, that'd be great. If you know a Saudi prince, apparently it's on his yacht somewhere. So if you could help me find that, that would be amazing. What's crazy is when you start thinking through the Salvatore Mundi, Salvatore Mundi, which basically means the savior of the world. Like everyone is like, this piece of art is amazing. And it is the most valuable piece of art that's ever been sold in the history of the world. Salvatore Monday, Salvatore Monday, Salvatore Monday, Savior of the world. You know what no one is asking? The $450 million question that's more valuable is about the subject of the painting, not the painting. Like, is Jesus the Savior of the world? Did God send him into the mess? to be the savior of the world, to rescue and save, to give all of us that are imperfect, we've already admitted it to each other, the chance and the right to be restored as much love sons and daughters. You wanna know what's more valuable than $450 million? The answer to the question, is he the savior of the world? What's cool, in Nashville in 1935, um, there was this like group of research people and they bought this, um, like a bunch of stuff from Egypt to kind of do some research on it. And in, it's called the Ryland Institute. They found this little, like bigger than a credit card size of like papyrus that's called P52 now. And it's the oldest dated um, back to the, like it's pre 100. It's like AD 100, AD 125-ish dated piece of papyrus, which is a, like it would, 
like papyrus is hard to keep. I don't know if you've had any papyrus lately, but it's hard to keep because uh, it, 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 it does that. So P52, and when they realized it was bigger than a credit card and it was written on both sides. So in the first century, apparently they liked to write on both sides of the paper. They were so efficient. Thank you so much. But what this piece of P52, it's the, it, it, what it shows, it's John 18. And this is what it says. It's the oldest piece that we have. Pilate said, it's John 18, 31 through 33 on one side in Greek. And it says, Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death that he was going to die. Verse 33, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Like, are you who God sent? Are you who you say you are? Now, the flip side, if you flip the papyrus over, you get to John 18, 37 through 38, and it says this, "You You are a king then. Said Pilate, Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. So we got Salvatore Mundi, savior of the world, P52, the oldest papyrus that we have to date, closest to the original document, talking about is Jesus who he says he is? And will he do everything that he promised to do? Man, I am convinced I've bet my life, I've bet my eternity that Jesus still saves. I wouldn't pretend to know where you are or what you're navigating, but can we just call a truce for a second? All your doubts, all your cynicism, all your skepticism is actually not an obstacle to the faith. It actually can be a catalyst for your faith if you'll be honest with it. Man, I just am firmly convinced if we would call a truce that God is who he says he is and will do everything that he promised to do and that he still reigns, the Bible still speaks and Jesus still saves can be true for us, not just like globally, but individually. Right in the midst of your mess, Jesus still saves. He's not annoyed by you. He's not trying to get away from you because you're just bad. He is, Jesus moves towards the mess in our life because he wants to pay for it. And he wants to restore us and make us right as much as sons and daughters. Jesus still saves. Is Jesus Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world? Is he the savior of the world? Not just the painting to know about it and marvel at, but to know the subject of. Is he the savior of the world? But if he's the savior of the world, then, then he's the savior from what? And I don't think I need to convince us much that we are broken and messy and maybe that's why we start every week with like, man, we are not perfect. And we're not trying to like, like take great pride in the fact that we're not perfect. We're not trying to shame each other that we're not perfect. But we got to realize that we are all not perfect because we have broken the contract between us and God. We have royally on our own when we lead our life messed things up. Can you just knock the person next to you and be like, he's talking about you, dude. So <laughs> like you totally messed this whole thing up, right? It's helpful that we don't have to feel like we've got it all together or we're spinning all the plates or our Instagram life is like what we put out in front of everybody to realize like without Jesus, I am sunk. And without Jesus, you are sunk. So we don't have to pretend anymore. There's no faking fine around here that without Jesus, we are sunk. So he's saving us from what? It's the sin thing, this rebellion thing, This like a good God that created us and gave us purpose and his presence and all that stuff. We kind of said, I got it from here. You go do your own thing because I got this. And then when we led our life on our own, we led it towards destruction. Even if you have great character without God, that's great. If you're an awesome person, that's great. Even if you're an awesome mom, that's great. But without God, we will train wreck our lives left to ourselves. Towards power, money, pleasure, honor, fame. We always train wreck it. So the sin thing that separates us from a loving God, we create it. We said, I got this from here. And we did it our own way. You know that, but the good news is that you cannot be more condemned. I cannot be more condemned at all than when I walk into this room separate from who Jesus is. It doesn't get any worse than being separated from who Jesus is no matter what you've done or no matter where you've been. 
God is not like a shame-filled God that's just piling it on, piling it on, piling it on, piling it on. Like, like when you train a dog to not, you know, in the house, you like tell them that don't do that. You put their nose in it and they're like, don't do that here. You do that here. You probably don't train your dogs that way because you're very nice. But most people train their dogs like to get their nose in the mess and then train them where to do their mess somewhere else. And God is not like that with us. He is not piling on the shame today to go like, yeah, you just are not a good person. And you did this and you have, I, I know everything you've done. I know everything about you. I know everything you've thought and I'm really disappointed. That's not what God is doing. Like it doesn't get any more like condemned than when you walked in separated from God. But what God does, because he is good and kind, he just shows you how good he is and how much he loves us and that he sent the price for our condemnation to already be paid, for our sin to already be paid in Jesus. And so I am so pumped to walk through some of my favorite verses about the fact that Jesus still saves. That's the message today. Like, like Mike's favorite verses from the Bible um, message. It's a little bit different of just like who Jesus is and the fact that you have the, the chance to be a rescued son or daughter of the Most High God. And I don't want you to miss it. So it starts like this in 1 Timothy 1, 15. It says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Woo! Of whom I am the worst. Can we just turn to the person next to us that we told that they weren't perfect? Hey, you're not perfect. Can we just turn to the person next to them, like, for real? Can you just go, dude, I am, I am the worst. <laughs> just go ahead. One, two, three, go. I, I am the worst. When we have the humility to walk in and go like, dude, I'm not trying to be all that. I'm not trying to say I got it all together. I'm literally walking in, all of us, going, dude, without Jesus, I'm, I'm the worst. It's really hard for me to be judgmental and condemning to you when I realize what I've been rescued from and that I'm the worst. So we, if we have the posture as Christ followers that have been rescued, dude, I got, I got nothing to condemn you on. Do you know why? I'm the worst. Without Jesus, hello, I'm the worst. Can we just say that together? I think it'll be helpful. Just on the count of three, we're going to say, I'm the worst. All right, there's four words. You got this. One, two, three, I'm the worst. Tomorrow when you wake up, Look in the mirror, you'll look great. It's fine, you'll look great in the morning. You know what you start with? I'm the worst. But Jesus still saves. I'm the worst, but Jesus still saves. Can you understand the heart of gratitude and a life of gratitude that you would live out if you understand that you are the worst? but Jesus still saves? Woo, let's stay right there. John 12, 46 says it this way. I have come into the world, this is Jesus, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Feel like your soul is dark, like your coffee, like, you know, it's like black, like you know, void and meaningless, like your soul. That's how I drink my coffee, uh, just because I want it to reflect my soul. But it, it's a joke, it's a joke, kind of. Uh, no, but without Jesus... I mean, we need Jesus to be the light of the world in our darkness. Not just the world's darkness, but in our darkness. He's the light of the world. Mark 10, 45, this is Jesus. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Like you were kidnapped by the enemy, kidnapped by your choices, kidnapped by our sin, and God sent Jesus to serve as a ransom. I don't care what Liam Neeson movie you want to watch, it doesn't get better than Jesus for our souls. I love that verse. Ephesians 2, this is like a huge chunk of scripture that's one of my favorites, and it, it just, I'll walk through it together. It just says, as for you, 
you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Let's just stop there for a second. You're walking in without Jesus, you dead. I don't care how good you've tried to clean yourself up and you look great. You look great this morning. That's, I mean, amazing. But on the inside of us, when it comes to the rebellion that we have against God, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. God does not just make peop good people better or clean up dirty people. He makes dead people alive. That's what we celebrate when Jesus still saves. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Do I need to describe what that looks like? Or is that our autobiography? Good? Okay, got that. Like the rest, we were by nature uh, deserving of wrath, but... I, there's some significant buts in the Bible, so there's a butology there. Whenever God says but right here, it changes the sentence that we were this way, but God. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace that you've been saved. Whew. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. But because of his great mercy, God moved towards us. That even when we were dead, made us alive through Jesus. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Meaning like God has got you on a trophy case, not because you're a trophy person, but because you're a rescued person and he just wants to keep dumping kindness and grace on, onto you through Jesus because that's who he is. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I am the worst, but Jesus saved my soul. I got nothing to boast in. I didn't get myself up out of the mess, and I know there's some self-made people in here that have pulled themselves up by them bootstraps, and they work real hard, and we do all the thing, and we think we got everything that we have coming to us because of the way that we've been working and the way that we deserve, but I am the worst sinner in the room. But because of Jesus, I'm a rescued son of the Most High God. I got nothing to boast in other than the rescue of my soul from Jesus. For we are God's handiwork, this is verse 10, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Another translation would say, you are God's masterpiece. Like God knows exactly what he gets when he gets you. And he's not annoyed. And he's not running away. He's like, that's my son. That's my daughter. That's my masterpiece. Exactly as they are. Warts and all. Failure and all. Gray hair or no hair and all. Baggage and all. I paid for that. It's mine. John 3, 16 and 17, you probably have heard this before, seen this before. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, anyone is welcome, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. You're a whoever. You have the right, if you want, to be restored as a son or daughter. Mark 2, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I am the worst, but Jesus still saves. Jesus' own mission statement was not to come, like, claim a bunch of church people. And he loves the church. Don't get me wrong. His mission, though, was that people that feel like they're on the outside of it, that they could be in and have an invitation in. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Luke 19, 10, for the, this is him. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the 
lost. Romans 3.23, for all have, I am the worst. You're not perfect. No, you're not perfect. I'm the worst. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice for atonement, meaning paying the price at one, like making us back to much love sons and daughters through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners, this is my favorite chapter of the Bible, by the way, about Jesus. So we're all gathering around to hear Jesus. Like the people that were nothing like Jesus were gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You want to know what God is like? Like if you feel on the outside walking in, if you feel morally on the outside, like if you feel like you've gone too far, done too much, that God would never ex- like accept you. Like when Jesus, God in flesh, incarnate, was walking the planet, right? He, he was like with people that were nothing like him and they liked him. You want to know where God would be if he showed up on the planet? He'd be having a meal with people that were nothing like him, morally, ethnically. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. I know that there's probably a bunch of shepherds in the room that have a hundred sheep. So just go with me here. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? I'll stop for a second. No. I mean, as you think that maybe you would go do, if I've got a hundred things and I lose one, that's breakage and spillage. Like I'm good. Like we'll call it, like I probably, my daughter probably lost a dollar bill somewhere. We're good. We got 99, pro, pro, no, I won't go Jay-Z. We got, we got things there. Like, no, I don't think a shepherd would go after the one when you got 99 to care for, right? But not God and Jesus. Like what God is like, he cares deeply about the 99 sheep that are in the pen. But he cares extravagantly to risk it all to find the one annoying, rebellious black sheep out there somewhere that is just like, we just go like, why is that sheep always does this? Idiot sheep keeps doing the same thing over and over, keeps getting stuck in the same habit, keeps getting stuck in the same kind of relationship, keeps getting stuck in the same rebellious behavior. That sheep, oh my goodness, that's what we think God is like. And like eventually, wouldn't God be like, just just let him go. We'll just hang with the 99 right here. No. 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 Jesus is like, that's not who God is. Verse 5. And when he finds it, he joyfully, it took me a long, it took me decades to understand joyfully there. Because the way that I viewed God, because I was not a church kid growing up, the way that I viewed God is that he was annoyed with me. That he was mad at me. That he wanted nothing to do with me. No, but God joyfully puts the one on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there is, what word? More rejoicing in heaven over one sinner. I am the worst. But Jesus still saves over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. You want to know what God is like? God is like restoring the one rebellious one and throwing a party about it. It goes on. So if there's a savior from what, then it's a savior to what. And then this is a real quick one. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You're not just rescued from your rebellion, from our rebellion. We're rescued actually to a life with Jesus that is full. And I don't know where you're walking in or what you're navigating what family dynamics you got going on or what marriage dynamics you got going on or what addiction dynamics you got going on or what kid dynamics you got going on or what money dynamics you got going on or what soul dynamics you got going on. But you have the chance to have life to the full. And not because you're awesome, but because Jesus is. I 
I just would want you to know from the bottom of my heart that God loves you. Right where you are. In that mess, in your hiding, in your confusion, in your drama, in your complication, right in this moment, man, God loves you. I'm not trying to go all goodwill hunting on us right here, but God loves you. And Jesus still saves. And we've been rescued from, and we've been rescued to. My question would be, will you accept that invitation of Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world, as your savior? Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, you got junk. Yeah, you don't know how it all works out. Yeah, you don't know if you believe all the things that you're supposed to believe yet. I get it, I get it, I get it. Is he the savior of your world? Not just the subject of a painting that you know some about and you like. Why don't you pray with me? God, you are good, and you're great, and you rescue and save. And without you, we're sunk. We love you, and we're grateful for the rescue and the fact that you still save. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.